Second announcement, something I am very excited about to share. Um, I'm going to kind of give the vision of this, and then I'm going to bring an entire small group, or at least part of a small group, up here with me. Okay, everybody, why don't you look at that, that awesome-looking map over there? Okay, everybody see the map? All right, so not only has God given us just an influential voice in this community, but for some reason, and I'm so thankful, sometimes I don't even know why the Lord in his grace has allowed this, but he has given this church an unbelievably influential voice in the world and in the movement of the 14,000 locations of YMCA's all over the world. And in case you haven't been here except for this Sunday, we say it almost every Sunday, that we have a unique role of helping to lift the sea, to lift the name of Jesus Christ in the Young Men's Christian Association. We are not here because we just want to rent a room until we become a real church and go buy our own building. We want to be here because this is the well of the community. Okay, we love being here. All right, there are 14,000 YMCAs all over the world in 120 different countries. Okay, and so... Often in December, we do like a Christmas missions initiative. And this is what we're going to do this Christmas, okay? Over the course of this last year or two, we have been able to create something which I'm going to call for this morning, Seeds of the Gospel, okay? We've created a book, uh, this was a couple years ago, that um, was written to basically share the story of the YMCA and how to be mission-driven in the YMCA. This last year, um, one of our small groups, uh, this was written by Jamie Rotello. It was illustrated by the amazing Sarah Sprague. There's songs and dances that go with this by, by Elizabeth Swift. And, and just a small group basically came together and said, why don't we tell the story of the YMCA in a children's book? And um, this was written, this was translated into Spanish, by the way, and this is just going out all over the world, okay? And so, here's what we're going to do this Christmas, okay? We have this idea. Let me share the idea, okay? There are 120 YMCAs, as we, YMCA countries, okay? And as we have prayed over this map and prayed over different countries, there are several that we have connections with or we feel that the ground is fertile, or we feel like this country has been too impoverished to get to any conferences that we've spoken in, and we feel like if we could send them some of these seeds, if you will, if you will, that it can have a profound impact on that country. For some of them, it's an orphanage in the country. For some of them, it's a children's home. For some of them, this ripped my heart out. I found out about this just the other day. Bogota, Colombia, where we just sent three of our people for a mission trip. In Bogota, they have a missions initiative. They're saying, would you come help us plant a church here? And here is their outreach. The YMCA location is in the red light district of Bogota. And they have a mission where they reach out to the kids of the prostitutes in Bogota, sharing the name of Jesus, all right? We want to get them resources, all right? So here's what we're going to do, all right? I'm, I'm going to explain this, and if it's not clear, um, well, I'll try to make it clear, okay? Out there, there is a table, and we would love for everybody here, okay, either your family or just as an individual, to go to the table and pick up a packet that will have two of these books and two of these books and instructions for what we want you to do. And here's kind of what we want you to do. We want you to spend this week praying over these list of countries that we provide and saying, Holy Spirit, is there one that you are kind of nudging me towards, guiding me towards? Do you have a special kind of um, inclination towards a country? For example, my dad has done a lot of work in Guatemala. All right, I'm betting that Steve Newman picks Guatemala and we're going to have him write out a little card, give a little picture of his family, send a couple books to our contact in Guatemala. And we think that that will be a seed of the gospel that will help take root and maybe open up later strategic opportunities. We don't want to just do this, um, you know, flash in the pan event. We're looking for later partnerships where God's stirring up things all over the world. Okay, so... When you're done with this service, we would love for you to go to this table, pick up a packet, pray this week about a country. Next week, we're going to bring these back. We're going to pray over them. 
and then we're going to send them all over the world. Is that moderately clear? If not, it'll be written on a piece of paper, blah, blah, blah. I would love to bring um, a small group up that has been a part of this in a profound way. Um, This small group has kind of come together as the body of Christ, used different gifts that God has given them, and um, they've been part of just like resourcing and building into this initiative. And so just want to bring them up and have them make a few comments and then... And then uh, we'll pray. All right, Dave Conway, you're up, man. Thank you. The amazing Aaron Sprague. Yes. Um, look, we uh, as a group uh, started just thinking about the um, the in and the up and the out, and we felt like if we could serve together, we could grow together. And um, one of the one of the things that I love about our church is David teaches. Uh, practical application. So the, mm-hmm. one of the first things that as a group that we did is we recognized that we had the spirit of the living God inside us. Mm-hmm. And that if we followed that with the, we have a, a body of Christ and we started to look at the skills and the capabilities within our group that we didn't have to create any limits. We would try to do something that would kind of be a part of the broader community, the broader community here at Antioch. So we decided that we would dig in. You may remember the documentary videos that we did late last year. Yeah. Um, we started uh, and and built a team to send with David uh, to to create those videos to start to spread the word in support of David's awesome book. And then this children's book idea, uh, I think, came to Sarah initially. And lo and behold, on our team, we've got an author, an illustrator, music experts, logistics experts, uh, an awesome wife on the end down there. She happens to be mine. Um, <laughs> music and, I, and by the emphasis, the emphasis is mine. Um, so, so we just um, produced videos of music videos that are a part of, of this whole experience. And we did it all because the last 15 years, there's been this amazing like David's word, this amazing stirring yeah. that the, maybe the heartbeat of the church and the why is right here. Yeah. And we all get to be part of it. And uh, we didn't do this to convert 10 million people, although that would be cool. But if it's just one, yeah. if we change one life, yeah. it's an amazing blessing. So um, we just really believe that um, the body of Christ is real. Yeah. Um, we got guys on our team that can create big giant maps. And um, by the way, purple means there's not a Y, tan means there is. So when you think about and pray about which country uh, you want to support. Uh, and next week, we're going to bring back all these packages and we're going to set them up on the stage and we're going to pray over them Yeah. and distribute them around the world. And uh, they'll have the impact that um, God chooses to have. Amen. So with that, Jeffrey. So I had the wonderful privilege to go with David and Ashley to Denmark for the World Alliance Conference. And there we were able to come in contact, thankfully, with a number of people that are Christian leaders of the Y all over the world. And it's amazing the work that they do. But I want to share a couple of stories because it's, it showed me the opportunity we have with these seeds. We were able to share a number of books with the contingent that came from Nigeria. And I got an email from them just a few weeks ago that they've taken these books and they've taken them out to the community and are sharing the story of the YMCA with the churches and the community around them, with the children, teaching them to read and about what the Y is about. And the email I get back says that these children were talking about how it's wonderful to have the love of God in their heart. Yeah. It's wonderful to know Jesus. It's wonderful to know. And that is what we as a church have the opportunity to do is share to see and not sparingly. Let's yeah. sow them bountifully, yeah. water, and then let God give an increase. Come on. Because he, he is ultimately to be praised for it all. Amen. So what a great blessing, opportunity we have. So very much appreciate Preacher it. Jeff, will you pray for us, man? Absolutely. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come yeah. before you in prayer, thankful for this privilege, this opportunity to come, to worship you, to look to you and to your wonderful son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We pray, Lord, that... 
you'll be with us in this service be with david give him words of comfort words of that we need to, to stir up in our hearts and in our minds the spirit that's within us that resonates yeah. with you and your holy spirit we're thankful we're prayerful yeah. we're hopeful and these things we pray in jesus name amen amen thanks guys why don't we uh, give a hand to the Lord and to how God's used this small group? Amen. Well, hey, if you have your Bibles, why don't you meet me in the book of Luke, chapter 2. Um, it's the chapter usually known as the Christmas story. And, um, and we're going to look at God's word this morning, and we're going to ask, like we do every Sunday, that God would not just give us cool verses and a story, but that he would just meet us there, that he would, he would transform us, that he would, that he would touch us like only he can do deep in our spirits. So, so Luke chapter two, but I am going to start in Romans chapter 15, because there has been a verse this week that has been just just rocking me. It has been hitting me. It has been something that I've been longing for as I've been reading, and it's something that I'm often longing for and looking to live in more consistently. Okay, so I, I want to read this verse to you. This is Romans 15. Can I have it on the screen? Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Look up at the screen. Here's what it says. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I say that again over us? May the God of all hope fill us with joy and peace as we trust in him so that we will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? This verse is saying that there is, there's a source of hope. And by the way, when I say hope, this is not hope like Oh, I hope Ohio State beats Georgia in two weeks. It's not just, it's not, I do hope that, but that biblical hope is this. Biblical hope is a confident expectation that is rooted in the character and the promises of God. Can I say that again? A confident expectation that's rooted in the character and the promises of God. It's when you know that you know that you know something and it affects the way you live, okay? And this is saying, a follower of Jesus can not only have hope, but overflow with a certain kind of hope. And it's also saying that the God of all hope puts the characteristics of joy and peace within us so that we become this like fountain of hope that's overflowing. Look up at me. Is that your life? Wouldn't that be an awesome description of life? If someone would say of you, hey, you know, you know her, she, man, she is so full of joy and peace that her life is just gushing with this hope. I'm thirsty for hope and I see it in her. Or if you'd look in the mirror and be like, God, how, how do I feel today? How do I feel? It? Joy, peace, hope overflow. Or that your kids, that your grandkids would be able to say of you, you know, my grandpa, you know, you know, my mom. She's got joy and peace and overflowing with hope. A lot of my life is lived in this. There's times where I am searching for that, okay? I'm fighting for that truth that I know is real. This last week, I heard this, this phrase that was meaningful to me. I was uh, on a Zoom call with this German YMCA leader, and I was like, Hi, hey, how are you doing? And this is what he said. He said, we have a phrase in German the language of German that basically says, one eye is crying, one eye is celebrating. Like, like one eye is feeling sorrow and one eye is feeling hope. Do you know what that feels like? Do you know what that means? Because I resonate with that. Like, like honestly, if you were to say, you know, David, how are you doing? How's your family doing? I, I would say, like very real, I would say, we're doing awesome. Like all this hope, all this joy, twinges of heartache, for sure. Twinges of pain, but all this hope. Or if someone were to ask me, which they often do, you know, tell me how Antioch is doing. How's your church? I can honestly say, without exaggeration, this has been one of the greatest years of ministry that I have experienced in 23 years of being a pastor. There's been nothing 
like the joy of this year. And also, I got a couple of I got a couple of things that are ripping my heart out. Like like joy, gushing of joy, yeah, a little bit of sorrow, heartache. And my question, and it's a question that I got to answer for myself, and I hope you will see that we can answer for you too this morning, is is it possible to live in this one-eyed pain, one-eyed joy, and yet joy, peace, and overflowing with hope? Is it possible for there to be hope in the midst of heartache. And what does that look like? And how do you live like that? How do you live so you're not like totally rooted and weighed down and anchored to the couple little pain sources in your life where hope and joy and peace is not overflowing? But instead, living with this hope even in the midst of heartache. That's my question this morning. And I'm going to show you from the Christmas story two people that lived like that. Okay? And we're going to look at their lives And we're going to say the defining attributes of their life allowed them to live in hope, even in the midst of heartache. And I'm going to look at you, and I'm going to say, will you please live like this? Okay? Everybody with me? So let's go Christmas story. By the way, not Joseph, Mary, shepherds, you know, fluffy little lambs, Christmas story. This is right after. This is right after that, okay? This is right after the Christmas story. I'm going to tell you... Luke chapter 2, the stories of Simeon and Anna, okay? And we're going to see hope in the midst of heartache. Luke chapter 2, verse 21 and following. Here we go. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Okay, can I just pause for a second? Let me just kind of unpack what's going on. Um, In Bible times, a child was not given his or her name until he or she was eight days old. Uh, Truthfully, it was because of child mortality. There were all these infections, all these diseases, and often, you know, a kid just didn't live to be eight days. But if he or she did, statistically, they were probably going to make it, and it was in that moment that they were given a name. Okay, And when they were given that name, if you were specifically a male, the firstborn male, it was required by religious law that you would go to Jerusalem and you would present this baby boy to the Lord. It was a baby dedication moment. It was a, God, you've blessed me with this child and we dedicate this child back to you. And you would bring a sacrifice. Okay, So normal families would bring a lamb. Okay, But the law kind of made this provision that if you were too poor to afford a lamb, you brought a pair of turtle doves, whatever that is, and you brought, or two pigeons, either two turtle doves or two pigeons. Okay, so everybody with me? Okay. Eight days ago in this story, what happened? We had Mary and Joseph, manger, Bethlehem, born in this cave stable, Baby is born on the dirt, on the straw, surrounded by animals, laid in a feeding trough manger. You got 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old Mary. She was was young, a young teenager, Mary. You got Joseph, who was probably, you know, 19, 20, 21. You got young man Joseph. You've got teenage girl Mary. And they've had their first baby, okay? And first of all, they had to trek from Nazareth couple-week journey down to Bethlehem. There's no way they're going back to Nazareth in this eight-day trip. This, this last week, I was like thinking, I mean, what'd they do for the last eight days? Like, they didn't go back to Nazareth. They didn't, it's not like they were in a, like this sanitary hospital with a lactation consultant and like, welcome to your new baby. Like, like they didn't, like, they were overwhelmed. They were exhausted. They were, they were like, in Bethlehem, and then having to make this trek to Jerusalem to go to the temple. And by the way, Jerusalem was like the epicenter of the Holy Land then and now, okay? 
And in the very middle of Jerusalem was the temple, which was this place which was like hustle, bustle, chaos, commerce, people there worshiping the Lord, people there trying to make a buck, people like it was, it was this packed out crazy place. And I want you to picture this scene, okay? You've got Mary and Joseph who have just had a baby. Eight days later, they make the trip to Jerusalem. They're walking around the temple like overwhelmed. And by the way, there's no way they could afford a lamb. They came with like a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, all right? They're poor, they're hungry, they're exhausted, they don't know what they're doing. And the story is about to intensify because watch what happens, okay? Verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout and waiting. I want you to underline that word if you have your text. And waiting. The theme of his life, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, which means like for the, the comforting or the completion of the people of God. He was, he was waiting for something. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God, watch this, and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Okay, so let me pause. So we got this guy named Simeon, okay? And he comes on the scene, and and here's what we kind of know about Simeon. Uh, We know he is righteous, we know he's devout, and we know he is waiting, all right? He's waiting. His life is defined by waiting, Because he had been told by God, and this is kind of strange, he'd been told by God, by the way, you will not die until you have seen the Christ, the Messiah. And for those of you who um, maybe are familiar to the Bible, um, kind of the overarching story of God is world is created, world is broken in all these pieces because of sin. And one day God would send the Messiah, the Christ, the answer that would put all the pieces together, the rescuer. The world is in bondage, but one day God would send someone who would set his people free, all right? And his name was Jesus. And God had revealed to this guy, Simeon, you are not going to die until your eyes have seen the Christ. Okay, so we've got in this scene, suddenly you got Mary and Joseph, overwhelmed, you know, exhausted, walking through, you know, Jerusalem, and suddenly, kind of, kind of strange, old guy pounces on the scene. God somehow reveals this is the day and this is the one. And he comes and takes The baby, and apparently, you know, Mary of Nazareth was far more trusting than Ashley Newman of Lebanon because, like, that would not have gone down in my house. Like, here, old stranger dude, here's the baby. But but Simeon comes upon, takes the baby, lifts the baby up, Simba-like, maybe, I don't know. Um, It's like, he's here. Like, this is like, like, this is the one. We live in a land of darkness. My eyes have seen the light. We're in a land of bondage, but the freedom bringer is here. This is the Christ. And then he says, you know, this, I don't know, I think it's kind of a funny prayer to say to God, Lord, take me out. Like, end of my story. Like, I I finally have got what I've been waiting for. Let your servant depart in peace. All right. And then look at, look at verse 33. Watch what happens. Um, and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Of course they did. Like, like they just, like, I don't, I don't think they even knew what to do. 
like they had just had this baby and, you know, surrounded by shepherds and God was like, hey, Mary, you're holding your child and my child. Crying little nursing baby and the son of the living God. And now you're in Jerusalem and some old guy is like, this is the light in the darkness. This is freedom. This is, and they, they're marveling at their sweet little baby dedication moment, which then took a turn. Watch this. Okay, next verse. Watch what happens next. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, now watch this. This child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, Mary, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. All right, Simeon blesses them, blesses this child, looks her in the eyes and says, all right, Mary, let me also make this clear. This child will bring light and freedom. Many will rise and many will fall because he will be the dividing point of all of history. He will be its hinge. He will be the fork in the road. People will either follow Jesus as Savior and Lord and spend eternity in heaven, or they will reject him and fall and spend a Christless eternity apart from him. This is the Savior. And by the way, Mary, like, it is tough to say at a baby dedication to a, I don't know, maybe 15-year-old girl. We don't know how old she was. Mary, one day nails will pierce his wrists and a sword will pierce your heart because your baby that you're holding in your arms is going to die. And he will be what will make people rise and fall. He will be the hinge of all of history. Look me in the eyes. Please don't miss this. He still is. He still is. The one central dividing point in the most important decision in your life is what are you going to do with Jesus the Christ? Is he good teacher, good guy, moral example, you know, like a holy version of Gandhi or something? Like, like you can take good moral character lessons? Or is he the God of the universe that is the one and only doorway to heaven? All right? And what you do with that question means everything. And Everybody in this world right now, like you can say, hey, have faith, like believe what you want, be tolerant of everything, like believe whatever God you want. The moment you say Jesus Christ is the one and only way, truth, and life, and in him, in him is the answer, all hell will literally break loose on you. And he is the hinge point. And Simeon says this, and then, like, implication, like, story over, dude goes home and dies, end of his life, all right? And I want to pause there, and looking at his life, I want to ask the question, did he find hope in the midst of heartache? Like, could he validly, could we look at his life and say this was a life that validly was filled with heartache and pain and hopelessness, and did he find hope? And so I would say yes. And so let me, let me just kind of bring us to, to how I think Simeon found hope in the midst of heartache. First of all, could he have had valid heartache? Yeah, like I think when you look at his life, you need to realize that the defining aspect of his life was a life of waiting. For a promise of God that he believed was from the Lord that would bring fulfillment. And day after day after day, he spent waiting. Look at me. Do you know what that's like? Do you know what it's like to be waiting for something that you believe is in line with the heart of God, character of God, promises of God? Do you know what it's like to, to be waiting, praying day after day after night after night for for a child who you're kind of estranged from to one day come back to know the Lord? Do you know what it's like to be waiting for this meaningful relationship that you've been longing for forever? Do you know what it's like to be waiting for work that you feel like is purposeful because you feel like you're just, I don't know, being used and banging your head against a wall? And when will I be able to work in something 
that makes a difference. Do you know what it's like to be waiting for a relationship that's broken and you're longing for it to be restored? Do you know what it's like to be waiting for, for a child because all you want to do is get pregnant and you just feel, feel like God's given you this desire in your heart and you're waiting and wait. Do you know what it's like to be waiting? Because he spent his life waiting. And from a little boy to now, he would go day after day after day to the temple. And I assume that ever since God revealed it to him, every day he would wake up and be like, is this the day? And is this the one? Looking around over and over. Is this the day? Is this the one? Is this the day? Is this the one? And day after day after day, and the implication is that Simeon is old. He was waiting unfulfilled. Do you know what that's like? Hold on to that if you don't, and I'm going to return to that later. But you could have looked at his life and said, man, a lot of your life is heartache, okay? So how did he find such hope? I'm going to give you three points, all right? I'm going to show you in his life, I'm going to show you in Anna's life, and then I'm going to look to your life, all three of the same points. Here's the first one. It has something to do with his ears, something to do with his eyes, something to do with his mouth. What he's listening to, what he's looking for, and what he's speaking. Okay, so here's the first point if you're taking notes. With his ears, he was listening to the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. With his ears, he was listening, he was hearing, he was seeking, he was listening for the Holy Spirit. Let's look back at verse 25 through 27. Um, and I've highlighted this. This is Luke telling his life. And he's making a point, And Luke is not being discreet, okay? Here's Dr. Luke saying, let me show you his life. Watch this. There was a man in Jerusalem. His name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now watch this. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. This is just a couple verses. And over and over, Luke's like, hey, this is a Holy Spirit dude. Like, watch this. Holy Spirit is upon him. Holy Spirit is speaking and revealing to him. He's coming in the Spirit, which is a Greek phrase, which means something like influenced by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. Simeon had a daily walk. Please don't miss this. Where he was empowered by the Spirit of God, sensitive to the Spirit of God, influenced to the Spirit of God. Jesus said, when he left this earth, I am not leaving you as an orphan. In fact, I'm leaving my spirit and he will be in you. He will communicate to you. You can hear from him and understand him. And Simeon lived life in dynamic relationship with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And here's the point. If I were to bring out one point of this, I would say this. He was waiting with God while he was waiting for the fulfillment of the promises by God. Can I say that again? He was waiting with God while he was waiting for the promises to be fulfilled by God. He didn't understand what was God doing and when was God wanting to do it. But the Holy Spirit was upon him and speaking to him and communicating to him. And he was influenced by the Spirit. All right? And why is that so important to hope? All right? Like, like why is it so important to say my dynamic relationship with the Holy Spirit of God is intricately tethered to hope. Okay, let me show you the Romans verse again. I don't know if you missed it the first time, but let me show this to you again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope, watch this, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to look at those words, joy, peace, hope. Here's my question for you. Do any of those words come from you? Do any of those words come from you trying harder to be a really good Christian and like, here's your, you know, behavioral strategy of the day. I'm going to try to be more joyful and peaceful and have more hope. That is not how the Christian life works, okay? The Christian life is this process of saying, God, I don't have joy and peace on my own. I don't have... A 
overflowing hope of my own, but you are in me. And as I listen to you and trust you, respond to conviction from you, ask you to empower me so that your fruit is manifested through me. God, you create hope in me by your power, not by my own power. Christian life is not based on your effort. It's based on the power of the living God who wants to live in you and through you and produce things in you and through you that you can never do on your own strength. He wants you to live in joy and peace and it has more to do with your relationship with him. And I don't know a lot about Simeon. Luke doesn't tell us a lot about Simeon. But he says... He was revealed things by the Spirit. The Spirit was upon him. He was influenced by the Spirit. He was going to the temple in the Spirit. It's like this guy lived a Spirit-tethered life. Does that make sense? So with his ears, he was listening and responding to the Holy Spirit. Next point. With his eyes, he was looking to the Lord along paths that lead to the Lord. If you look at verse 25, it says, he was waiting. But let me unpack that verse um, in Greek. That word waiting is not a word for passive waiting. It's a word for active waiting. Can I tell you the difference? Um, it didn't used to be like this, but now if you go to uh, Starbucks and you see people waiting in line, what are they doing? Like, like what, are they, what are they doing as they wait in line? Anybody? They're on their phone. Like, is that it? Like, they're passively waiting. If you see people waiting in line almost anywhere, what are they doing? They're, they're waiting on their, they're passive. They're not doing anything. They're passing time. It's possible to be waiting passively, or it's possible to be waiting actively. This is a word which means active waiting. What is active waiting? If you see Simeon, it said basically in this text, day after day after day, he was going to the temple, meaning, and here's what I think it means, okay? There are these paths in our life that God can use to kindle up, to stir up hope. We can look for the Lord and we can see paths where we meet the Lord. He's going to the temple day after day. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It means he is worshiping the Lord. He's fellowshipping with others at the temple. He is deeply immersed in God's word. He is walking these paths as he's looking for the Lord. And he's not waiting passively. He's waiting, he's waiting actively. And so my question for you, and I'm going to get into this later in the application. Are there rhythms in your life, paths in your life, in the midst of your heartache, in the midst of your pain, where you are not just passively kind of ambivalent and apathetic, saying, God, when will this change? Is this the day? Is this the one? Versus saying, Lord, I'm going to look for you and your promises. I'm going to go after you and your promises. And I'm going to surround myself with people and open up your word and seek your name and live in such a way that the paths I walk on can stir up hope. All right? Are you down and discouraged and depressed? My question for you will probably be like, hey, are you hanging out with other believers? Are you delving deeply in God's word? Are you seeking him in prayer? Are you walking these paths that God has designed to stir up hope within you? Are you looking for the Lord with your eyes? Because Simeon goes his whole life, and finally at the end of his life, verse 29, it says, I've seen what the Lord has provided. All right? With his ears, with his eyes, and can I say one more? With his mouth, he spoke blessing to God and to others. This is in verse, uh, I believe, 25 and 34. 28 and 34. I'm not going to put it on the screen, but look, look on the text. Verse 28, it says, He took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, or verse 34, it says, Simeon blessed them. This word blessing is a word that I've been studying these last few years. Um, honestly, most of my Christian life, when I talk about blessing, I'm like, well, God blesses us. God bless you. And it isn't blessing like God just like, I don't know, putting his divine goodness on us or something. I don't know. But biblically, if you study blessing, you see all these examples of people throughout Scripture blessing the Lord. 
Like, I bless you, God. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I bless you, God. Or you see all these examples of people blessing others. So can I, get, can I give you a definition of what this kind of bless means? To bless means to speak of the character of God, the goodness of God, the life of God. And when it's to God, it's speaking it back to him. Okay? It's saying, God, I bless you, meaning I, it's synonymous with I praise you or I extol you or I exalt you. I would speak of your character, your goodness, your, your life back to you. Okay? When you bless others, it means basically, I want to speak of God's character, his goodness, his life over somebody else. And please look at me and please don't miss this. Okay? I've missed this a lot of my life, and I've just understood it these last few years. All right. When you bless the Lord and bless others, meaning when you fill your mouth and your heart with the character of God, the goodness of God, the the life of God, and speak it to God and others, God uses that to stir hope in you. God uses that to light the fire of your heart back up again. Are you frustrated, discouraged, angry, depressed, apathetic? Like, like, are you going through those things? Are you in heartache this Christmas, struggling with hopelessness? Are you going through those things? Start opening up your mouth and praising God and blessing others and watch how God uses that path in your life to stir your heart to hope again. That is what Simeon was doing. With his ears, he's listening for the Spirit of God. With his, with his eyes, he's looking along paths actively. With his mouth, he is blessing the Lord. And therefore, he lived in hope in the midst of heartache. End of story. Can I give you a second story? And this one will have to go quicker. But, but this one is a story of Anna. And I'm just going to tell you her story, and I'm going to make the same three points. Okay, ready? So here's Anna's story. Watch this. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Okay, so here's our second story. Not a very complex story, not a whole lot of plot, not a whole lot of, you know. We've got an 84-year-old woman who comes up upon this scene in the baby dedication. And I would actually say this. She never left this scene because it seems like she never left the temple, according to the text. She was just worshiping the Lord and praying to the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord, speaking of the Lord night and day in the temple. And she sees Jesus and she just busts forth like in thanksgiving, okay? And so then that's the end of the story. Wasn't that an awesome story? Okay, but let me just unpack that story just a little bit. Um, First of all, valid that if you look at Anna's life, Would you say um, maybe a little heartache and potentially hopelessness? It says when she was a virgin, she was married uh, for seven years to her husband. Again, probably 14, 15, 16. I don't know. That's what it was back then. Seven years later, husband dies, and now she's 84, meaning probably 60-like years. I don't know. Of her probably feeling alone, probably asking questions. Probably like, why God? And what, like, like, I don't understand you, God. And yet, I would make the three, the same three points. Ready? With her ears, she heard from the Holy Spirit. And where am I getting that? Okay. It says, and Anna was a prophetess. Now, don't get freaked out by that word, okay? Prophetess, basically, we've studied this in the past and we're going to study this more in the future. What is prophecy, gift of prophecy? New Testament gift of prophecy is something like hearing from the Lord and communicating about the Lord. Okay? Hearing his heart and communicating it to others. And what it involves is this dynamic relationship with the Holy Spirit. I assume when it says Anna was a prophetess, it means, I assume Luke meant, 
that she was hearing from the Lord and saying, I think this is God's heart for you. She was hearing from the Holy Spirit and communicating that, okay? And a couple of years ago, we did this series called Spirit and Truth, and we kind of unpacked uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, and the other like seven spaces in the New Testament where it talks about the gift of prophecy. And if, okay, everybody look up at me for a second. If that's a little bit weird for you, or if that causes you pause or question mark, which I understand, we are going to study that more and really get that biblically right. And actually, at the end of January, we're going to host a conference here by these people by the name of Remnant Radio, who are awesome. And they're going to talk about what it means to hear from God biblically in such a way that we're subjected and submitted to God's word, but using a biblical word that we see everywhere throughout the New Testament. We're going to say, what is prophecy and how do you hear from God? And how does that exist today in such a way where God's word is true and central? All right? Anna, this is what I'd say about her. She was hearing from the Spirit of God and communicating it to others. Okay? Secondly, she was looking for the Lord along paths that kindle up like the Lord's presence, okay? Look at what it says about her. She was fasting. She was praying night and day. You know, I, I can't say this with certainty, but I think this text would implicate, like, that she didn't even, like, live at home. In her pl- like, it seemed like she lived at the temple, okay? She was walking these paths, and finally, she was blessing people with her mouth. She began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. She was blessing God, speaking to God, blessing others, speaking to others. Okay, can I talk about our lives? All right. I want to talk about these three points in your life and my life. First of all, I want to ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand. But when it looks at this verse, Romans 15, can I pull that back up? A life overflowing with hope and joy and peace. Is that your life? Is that elusive in your life? Are you fighting for that? Or is that your life? And honestly, like Anna and Simeon, like let's be real, are you waiting for something? Because truthfully, I've I've been a pastor for almost 23 years now. I've had a lot of coffees with people. Let me say something with some authority. Almost everybody I find is waiting for something. Like, like, I rarely come across somebody that doesn't have a little bit of heartache in a certain area, and they're waiting for something. And so my question for you, honestly, is can you find hope in the middle of that heartache, okay? Can you find hope that is greater, like overflowing hope in the midst of the, you know, wasting away tent of this world? And I would argue, just like Simeon and Anna, these three points, here's the first That hope comes when with your ears you are hearing from the Holy Spirit and being empowered by the Holy Spirit who is the source of hope, okay? So so can I just tell you my life a little bit, what I'm learning? When I spend each day and, and say, God, by your Spirit, would you fill me? Would you make me sensitive to any areas that are hurting you or, or out of alignment with you? Would you speak to me and communicate to me and show me how you want to use me throughout this day and give me a sensitivity to your gentle nudging? So let me tell you two stories of this last week. First one, one good story, one bad story, both about me. First story, here's the good story. Um, most days I go to the YMCA. So one day I went to the Y and I was like, Holy Spirit, would you guide me And open my eyes to see what you're doing and help me to have conversations that are full of you. And in that next hour, I had three amazing conversations. I felt like they were God-led and like the Lord like used me. I was able to listen and communicate and talk. And I felt like God kind of touched those conversations. And I left the why that day. I know this is not a dramatic story or anything. But I left the why that day and I was like, you know what? I heard from the Lord. And I feel hope in the Lord, okay? Second story. Um, This last week, I went to Costco. 
and was tempted by the clothing aisles of Costco. Um, I am convinced, I heard this comedian say this just a couple weeks ago, and I'm, I'm convinced, um, this, this is off point, but it's important nonetheless, that how old you are is tethered to how many of your clothes have Kirkland tags. <laughs> All right? And how you don't care anymore if you start to say things like, 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 why do I need to buy jeans anywhere else? Why do I need to buy flannels and jackets anywhere else? Look at Costco's. So anyways, so this, maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. So this last week, um, I walked into the saw, and there was this, like, awesome-looking, like, flannel, like, jacket thing that was $30 on sale for $20, but it should have been, like, $150. It was so stinking awesome. And I was like, Surely I'm supposed to get that. Surely, like, God wants me to get that. I literally prayed, which I sometimes do. I'm trying to do more often. I said, Lord, do you want me to buy this? And I kid you not, I felt this gentle, like, twinge sort of impression on my spirit as if the Lord was just saying, I could have been wrong, but I, I feel like the Lord was saying, um, no, you, you, haven't, you haven't enough. To which I rationalized, there's no way God would be saying that. I mean, there's only $20. This is going to look awesome on me. So I, I was like, surely God wants me to have it. There's only one left of my size. I bought it. I brought it home, put it on. It's like, Ashley, in this awesome, like, look at my new jacket. She was like, eh, no, actually, I don't like that very much. Um, a little too big. Doesn't look that good on you. Um, I did the coolness check with my kids. I was like, do I look like a cool, relevant pastor? or is it, And they were like, eh, maybe. Eh, I don't know if I really like that. And my point is, I feel like in a normal, practical, everyday thing, I just didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. I could have obeyed him, which I felt like he was saying, nope. All right? And I'm telling you that I think more than we realize, the Lord wants to communicate with you. He wants to gently nudge your heart. He wants to speak to you through conviction and through other areas of how, of how you can have just a dynamic walk with the Holy Spirit. And so I would tell you to listen to him, okay? And he can produce hope. Second point, with your eyes, look for him while you walk paths where you can find him, where he kindles up joy, Okay? I said this the first service very boldly, and I'm going to say it again, okay? First service, we had about 40 little kids up here singing Away in the Manger. It was sweet, cute, awesome. Um, and I looked out at the parents, and this is what I said. And I'm going, to, I'm going to apply this to kids, but this can be applied to you. I could give you 48 illustrations. I'm just going to do a kid's one, okay? I have four teenagers, and I can say this with absolute authority. Every one of these 40 kids will go through a time at some point where they're struggling with hope, heartache, discouraged, like, like, like feeling like God is distant, like every single one of them. And the question that I ask to the parents and I'm asking you now is when they do that, will you encourage your kids, your teenagers in that day when it comes, which it's coming to walk paths where, where they will experience the Lord and hear from the Lord and be with other fellow teenage believers in the Lord. And I said, we offer like, like worship nights and roots and discipleship times and, and all these opportunities so that your teenagers can be in the presence of God along paths that create joy. And I've met with family after family after family um, that is in heartache because their kids' lives right now are just like train wrecks and they don't want anything to do with God. And I've said, well, have you kind of encouraged them towards any of these paths? And I kid you not, every single conversation I've had that's painful, they've said, no, we don't, we don't want to force them, which I kind of agree with. I don't want to force anybody either. But I will say, in whatever way can happen where we're not forcing people, yet with all our hearts, we're encouraging your kids, and I'm encouraging you to put yourself on paths where you'll find the Lord, to be with other believers, to be with Bible studies, to be in small groups, to get your kids to our prayer nights, to get yourself in places where God will stir up if you're discouraged or ambivalent or apathetic or, or depressed or far from God, don't isolate yourself. Don't, don't like get yourself away from, from the goodness of God. It's like little glowing embers that need to be together. All right? 
And for goodness sakes, let us, let us do like, like I see in Simeon and Anna's life. I mean, they were there. They were there. All right? You don't need to just be a part of a church to sing cool songs and hear good messages. You need the body of Christ. If you're a parent of a little kid, one day your 15-year-old daughter needs the body of Christ. All right? We need Jesus in our life, okay? And then finally, to speak blessing. And I'll, I'll just say this too. When you are discouraged, when you're struggling with hope, when you're one eye crying, one eye rejoicing, to speak praise to the Lord and blessing over others, to speak blessing to God and blessing over others, and to watch as God will stir that up. I, I just challenge you over Christmas time. Worship team, would you come on up? Over Christmas time, let this be these next few weeks where you're speaking blessing to God and blessing to others. Let your life be filled with words that lift the Lord. Um, and then I think we can have hope in the midst of heartache. Can I pray for us? And then I'm going to lead us in communion. God, we love you. We need you. I thank you for Simeon and Anna's life, these lives that on paper seem like they should have been defined by heartache. And yet they lived in hope. And I just pray that our lives would look like that as well pray that my life would look like that, God. I pray that for the sons and daughters in the room, that, that their lives would look like that, that we would hear from you, Holy Spirit, that we would speak of you, that we would look for you, and that we would find what we're looking for. So we lift this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we're going to close with a time of communion. It's a time um, where Jesus basically was like, let me show you the real path of hope, all right? It's a path through his body and his blood. Um, his body was broken. His blood was shed. And so the night before he was crucified, he symbolically like broke bread and poured wine and said, take these to remember me. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time remembering the Lord. Um, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, this is something that we do to remember the Lord. Talk with him a little bit. Ask him, is he highlighting something on your heart to confess? Remember the Lord. Um, and then take communion if you're a follower of Jesus. And when the moment's right, stand up and we're going to close in worship. All right. Let me pray for us. God, would you meet us now in communion? Let us hear from you and respond to you. It's in your name we pray.